Jesus I surrender Humbly at his feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken Take me Jesus, take me now I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all All to Jesus Jesus, I surrender, now I feel the sacred flame, oh, the joy of full salvation, glory, glory to his name, I surrender. Thank you for that song. Um, unless we surrender everything, there can never be progress. If we're asking the Lord to bless us, He has already blessed us. He has blessed us with wisdom and understanding and the freedom and the liberty to acquire all of this. The fact that we are alive that we have a rational mind, that we are able to exercise choices and decisions and travel to places, including places of worship, is just a little drop in the bucket of what he loads us daily with his benefits. As us, David, uh, the, the wise man says, and as David would say, he loads us. Is this pressed, shaken down? That shows us that it's not just filled to the brim, it's pushed down to the bottom, that there's not enough room to receive it. But we must seek it. We must climb the ladder of Christian progress and growth, and it begins with surrender. Thank you for that song. I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. And as we usually do and will continue doing as God allows us, we will be not uh, really in indulging or, or um, looking at how man would look at things, but how God would reveal truth to us by reading his word. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 8. I know you've been through these verses before, but every time you go through it, and every time I review it, I see something new in it, which is the very evidence that it is God's word. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. How many of you have found it? Amen. All right. I'd like to begin with verse 1. Peter was one of the first three disciples. And the fact that he was one of the first three disciples shows us that he was called early on. And he endured one, a seeing one who was not only visible, but thank God that he was there when Christ was on this earth. Because Peter, uh, many people don't realize, as brash and as, uh, you know, he shot from the heap. He acted before he thought, but in due time, this man became transformed. And as we may have similar characteristics with him, thank God that God has given us the opportunity to be uh, converted. And as he told Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. 
Our work today is to strengthen one another. In strengthening one another, we strengthen our own faith. And in feeding upon God's word, we grow spiritually. And so we read here, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, and I like this, like, obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we share something in common. That is the precious faith of Peter and the apostles. Here in our God, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Multiplication. You just read what our, it's an, it, a thought of, of meditation on, in our bulletin today. We work on the plan of multiplication one day at a time. God works on the plan of multiplication and he has no limit to what he can do. Time is not a problem to God. According, in verse 3 it says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Again, it's all through, through the righteousness of God, through the knowledge of God, and here through the knowledge of him that has now called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this, that is, this great and precious promises, you and I might become partakers of the divine nature. There you have the keynote there, friends. Partaking of that divine nature, which we do not have, but which is our privilege to come into possession by the study of God's word and through the knowledge of him and through the knowledge of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and through the righteousness. So it functions in that way, through the righteousness of God and our Savior. In verse 5, so here's now the addition of all these things that we are empowered to do, to add to, as God multiplies them. And beside this, verse 5, giving all diligence. That's due diligence. It's not a haphazard work. It's committed. It's constant. It's vigilant. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things that we just read be in you, within us, abiding in us, and abound through addition, and by multiplication, what do they do? They make us that we shall neither, neither be barren, nor unfruitful in what? It's all in Jesus Christ, right? We started reading that. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, through the knowledge of God, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory, it says, we shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, here's the big but, but he that lacketh these things, which we just read, is blind and cannot see afar off. Now we're just talking about Jeremiah, the, the weeping prophet. The author of Lamentations, the book of Jeremiah is called Jeremy in the book of Matthew. He wrote about the, the, the persecution that was to come upon the household of Christ. He says here, 
while he prophesied of the terrible desolations that would come on account of the extreme apostasy and abominations done by God's people, he warned them. But he would also suffer with them. What a terrible thing that is. Some people will warn and be spared the consequences of rejecting the warning. But a prophet like Jeremiah, he suffered with them. And it may be the lot of some people to proclaim the message of warning in the love of Christ as a means of salvation, but at the same time to suffer with those that have been warned and those who have rejected even the message. Truly indeed, the description of that prophet, the weeping prophet, Lamentations. If you have never read the book of Lamentations, it's about time you did. But here, Jeremiah, even if he was called early to the office of the priesthood, out of the prophetic office, trained of the Levitical priesthood coming from the tribe of Benjamin, from which Saul came from and the Apostle Paul as well. Um, he was given, he was given the, the, the precious because he needed that and we will need that to be able to see the glorious future. In other words, he had by faith to penetrate the dark veil by faith and look beyond the trials and the darkness of the present to the glories of the future. That is faith. And notice as we read to this ladder of Christian progress, it begins but does not end with faith. This is where many Christians have failed and will continue to fail. They begin at the first round, the first round, the first step of faith and stop there. They don't continue climbing and say this is all that we need, this faith. That is wrong. That gives us the reason why many will become barren and unfruitful. Because these things do not abound in them. Or maybe in us. So, but he that lacketh these things is blind. There is a solution to blindness. And that is have our vision restored, right? That's all it is. We need our visions restored and God restores that vision. But we must have an eye single to the glory of God. That's what makes the difference. That the blindness will disappear. He says, he that is blind cannot see afar off. People like to see the here and now. But it takes faith to see what is yet to come. For things that are seen are temporal and things that are not seen are what? Eternal. One of the reasons why people cannot see afar off is they refuse to. It also shows us that they have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He wants to go right back. While the idols have been struck down, the heart has not been transformed. So even if you have reformation after reformation and apparent success, it doesn't last long. There has to be a fundamental, substantive change from within. No cosmetic procedures will do that. Cutting off the branches and the leaves of a deceased tree won't render it cured. It has to be struck at the roots and uprooted and replaced. And so here we're urged by the apostle by his experimental knowledge of God. I was just reading the other day, and maybe last night what it was, that even if Josiah, the boy king, had successfully conducted a reformation destroying the high places of the earth, the idols, the worship of Asherah, and all the pagan, heathen deities, the apostasy continued. Why? Because there was no real heart transformation. That is the greatest miracle that we need today. 
It's not demanding for more miraculous physical miracles. But as Jesus said, behold, he told them, he said this to the people who were expecting a literal kingdom to come. But he said, behold, the kingdom of God is one within you. It was hard to understand that. For the longest time, they had been educated or really mal-educated to understand the wrong things and the wrong interpretations. It was so deeply embedded and deeply rooted that when Christ spoke, the weighted Messiah, it was though he was speaking new truth. It wasn't. It was the oldest truth. But it had been bent out of shape by the misinterpretations of the religious leaders. And such is the case today, and ten times worse. That's why it behooves us to be able to, to understand and ask the Holy Spirit, plead for the Holy Spirit to do its appointed work by Christ. He says, if I don't leave, I can't send you the Holy Spirit. But when he comes, he can be with you all the way even unto the end of the world. He is not in the flesh and blood. He's devoid of the personality of humanity, but nevertheless, the third person of the Godhead. Verse 10, Paul, Peter says, Wherefore the rather brethren. See, this is due diligence here again. Do you see that word there? It says, Give diligence to make your calling and election Sure. Make sure that it is sure and steadfast. For if you do these things, thank God we're not being asked to surmise on what these things are. Otherwise, we reach a different conclusion, a different summit. But this ladder has a summit. There are specific steps given that we should step one after the other in Christian progress in the development of our growth towards the likeness of our Savior. That is the goal, as Paul will point out, and we're sure going to be reading uh, this time. It says, to make the calling your, my calling, election, and sure, for if we do this thing, what does it assure us, friends? We shall. What does it say in your Bible? You shall never fall. Now, that's a pretty strong statement to say, wait a minute, I'm born with a sinful human nature. With all these propensities and weaknesses and, and evil practices, uh, how can I never fall? I didn't say that. The Bible said that. If you keep telling yourself this and questioning yourself, you will never get there. You will never make the first step. You will never even start the faith portion of this growth and the step ladder towards perfection. Christian moral perfection. The problem is we have concocted the misinterpretation of the word perfection. It is our human perfection that we're dwelling upon, not the perfection that God requires and empowers us and modeled for us in Christ Jesus through the knowledge of Christ, through the knowledge of our Savior and through the righteousness of God. That is our problem. And we keep doing it over and over again. Hopefully, as we have been reviewing and reading the Bible, we shall cease to be doubters and really begin to be believers. Wherefore, and see what he says now? A reminder that we need to be reminded that he himself had to be reminded as Jesus reminded him. You know the experience of Peter. It says, and so he learned. He learned well. And he passes it on and we need to receive it and learn well and pass it on as well. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. That is diligence now. I will not be negligent to put you sometimes. Is that what the Bible says? In verse 12 it says, I will put you always. 
that doesn't recognize the change of weather, nor of circumstance, nor of age, nor of station in life. Everybody who believes he's going to heaven will go the same way. There's only one way. As Jesus said, I am the truth and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except through me. And so Peter continues, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. And I'm going to say that too. And I'm going to put a, put a highlight on this. And you do that too. Because this is how to make our calling in election sure. Uh, we shall never fall. Oh yeah, you will fall. I will fall as Peter did. When he took his eyes away from Christ, he fell. Christ raised him up and he began to walk again. You do that as often as you can and pretty soon you won't even know it. You might get into cruise control, but remember you never get on the cruise control. You and I are still living in this fallen, sinful human nature, this earthen vessel, and we're not above temptation no matter how close we walk to Christ, Satan is still alive. And so we are told to be neg never to be negligent. As it has always been said, you've heard this as a cliche, vigilance is the price of liberty. You want freedom, you need to stand on guard. When the question is asked in the prophetic verse, watchmen, what of the night? The question is to you and me. We're called to be watchmen of the truth. Even as we have been given the calling to be the, the light of the earth, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. That means we need to stay awake constantly. To be on our spiritual tiptoes. To put on the whole armor of God and never to set down any part of that armory in Ephesians chapter 6. We are in a battlefield. It begins in the day. It begins every day. But I thank God it's only one day at a time. God doesn't expect us to do all that he expects us to do on one day. He gives us a lifetime to do that. And so it eases up the burden. You, you, we can't be living on our past failures. If we have confessed them, God has taken care of them. Neither can we live in the future. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We need to live for today. And overcome for today. And climb the steps one rung at a time. So that we do not fall. See the problem is people are trying to leap forward and they fall backward. But those rungs are strong. They're solid because the foundation is Christ himself. And if we climb one day at a time, one rung at a time, looking at the goal which Christ set before us, and Paul understood this so perfectly well, he gave it in words that everyone can understand. That is, if we're willing to understand. Wherefore, I will not be negligent, that's verse 12, to put you always in remembrance of these things, Though you know them. Say, so I want to hear this. I've heard this before. The Bible says you need to hear that. If you'd known them before, you need to hear it. If you've never heard it before, you need to hear it. Always in remembrance of these things. Though you know them. Because that's the way, according to God's word, that we can be established and founded in present truth. By the way, present truth is eternal truth. It's not something new. When God says, I am, you don't read through all this. When you said, I am the door, the word I am was right there in the beginning and has always been there. It is not subject to time. It's no past, present, or future. 
It is there. That is how unshakable our foundation is if we study God's word because it has always been there. So, giving all diligence, says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, that means there's growth. It's not static. It's not just a child and always a child. It starts as a child. John, if a thousand miles begins with the first step, make sure it's at the right direction. But it says, these things be in you. They're there. But it adds and abound. That is growth. And make you that you neither shall be barren nor unfruitful. In what? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So many Christians today, and I'm included there, think we know who Christ is. It's time to examine our faith and what we profess to believe. And we will be tested time and again. You know, as we often say, well, I, I, I encountered a person and he had so many things to say about the word of God and I was not too sure how to reply. Oh, be ready always to give an answer of, to a man who questions you. That's what we're told. And to reply to them with meekness and fear. But if we don't know who we are talking about, or what we are supposed to know, it's better that we remain silent. Because we're going to cause more confusion. Confusing ourselves and confusing others. It's not good, isn't it? And what we say, we first hear because our mouth is closest to our ear. And before it became even a spoken word, it was a thought. And so it's so careful as we dwell upon even our imaginations and pulling down the strongholds. We'll be reading that very shortly. Now, it's with little time we have, we can continue studying this, but we set again a firm foundation on this study. Jacob had a ladder that he saw in his night vision, isn't it? And so Peter's ladder is more of practical application to what Jacob was shown in vision. You know, so in the King James Version of the Bible, which is my favorite version, you may have other versions, but this is my favorite version, and it has been, I, I'm comfortable with it. And so have been the readers that have been converted millions and millions and millions of them since 1611, when they was put, in this version was put together. In, the, in this version, the word ladder is mentioned only once. Interesting, isn't it? It's found only in Genesis 28, 12. And it comes from the Hebrew Aramaic word, koam, which means a staircase. You know, which is de derived from the word that means to mount up. And that is to exalt. That's going deeper now. To exalt, now you're lifting this up now. To exalt, to cast up, not cast down. To exalt, to cast up, to extol, to make plain, to raise up. Staircase, ladder. A, a unique definition, and I like this because this comes from Webster's New World Dictionary of the American Language. There are many definitions. You can go through the web. But here, and I like this, because it comes right within the framework of the framework of which we are lo looking at. Peter's ladder. It, it, it says this, this word ladder is a framework of two pieces. A, a framework of two side pieces connected by a series of rungs for use in climbing up and down. And you will see this. The angels ascending and descending on the ladder, it doesn't only go up, it also comes down. There's act 
activity going, connecting the top and the bottom. It is a framework of two side pieces connected by a series of rungs for use in climbing up and down or any means of climbing. I like that phrase, a framework of two pieces combined. Now uh, that ladder won't work if they don't fit each other. It's not going to do what it's going to do. In fact, it's going to be a very dangerous thing to climb that ladder. You're not only going to break a leg, you're going to break your head. And perhaps perish. But you see this framework of two pieces connected by a series of wrongs, how significant indeed as we study the plan of redemption. And it for me represents a couple of things, much more than we have time to really discuss in its fullest, richest details. But one, it represents the union between humanity and divinity in Christ. He was 100% human when he incarnated. He never ceased to be God when he became a man. And in him is found that ladder connecting heaven and earth, the bridge to the gap that sin created. No man can cross that chasm or that gulf except through Christ. That said, the second one is this framework of two pieces connected by a series of rungs is the highest honor and privilege of being called brethren. You know, I, I think we, we take this for granted. When you say, hey brother, or he is my brethren, there's much more to that. When you go to the word of God, Jesus wants us to consider him the elder brother of the human race. When he took on that nature 4,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eden, he became the second Adam. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And thus he says, call me brother. I can't, you're God. How can I call you bro brother? He says, yes, I am the elder brother of the human race. To consider him the elder brother of the human race. Number three, in the work of salvation, God enlists fallen men. Angels could have done it, but he wouldn't cut it because it's not their work to save us. Its work is to work for us and minister to us. Only those who have received grace are those who needed grace and are those that can understand what salvation means. And so here, this whole oh, wonderful framework of two pieces connected by a series of wrongs, number three to me is the call to become co-laborers and co-workers with Christ on earth, which is continuing the work of proclaiming the gospel. How? In words and in deeds, by lips touched with live coals of fire from heaven's altar, as that of Isaiah. And I like the topic we're going through this morning. It's a continuous one. You need to come early for Sabbath school, friends. This is a continuum. You start early in the morning, and then we continue down to this time, and then later today. And then we are filled with the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. The written word, the living word. You see, then as co-laborers and co-workers with God... We do this in proclaiming the gospel, not just by speaking that or preaching that, but in words and deeds and by lips touched with the live coals of fire from heaven's altar and lives cleansed by the blood of Christ and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This goes on until Christ's 
character image is reproduced and reflected in the moral character and lives and conversation and lifestyles of his people on earth. And thus having been thoroughly, thoroughly shaken and then sifted by fiery trials and tribulations and sore temptations, like Christ. That's what, you know, Jeremiah was called the weep he was not called a weeping prophet for nothing at all. It was not a vain description, nor a careless one. It was a verity. He suffered terribly. But the suffering he suffered was for righteousness sake. And as Jesus said, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will reign with me in glory. Not here now. We want things here now. God says it's very short. You want something that will last for two years or you want something that has no time limit to it. But we have not taught our children patience because we ourselves are not. And so until we demonstrate that in our lives, it's not fair to expect it from them. The dross of character has been burned out. That's what burns. You see, the, the false teachings regarding God is that God burns us. If we don't obey him, you burn. I'll torture you. But when John the Baptist preached the message of preparing for the first coming of Christ and introducing the Lamb of God, take it away the sin of the world, the promised seed of Genesis 3.15, he says, he shall come and baptize you with fire. I've been through this last time. You need to go through it all the time. I'll put you always in remembrance of this, as Peter would say, is that that fire is not to burn us, but to burn our sins away and our weaknesses and our tendencies and our propensities. You can't take that away. You need to give it up. You need to surrender as the song goes. And then start climbing one step at a time, one day at a time. Then you'll reach that topmost rung and keep going from there. Burned out. And when those things are burned out that need to be burned out, then the gold is purified. And when the gold is purified, it will reflect the image of Jesus and how glorious that image is. We don't have much time left in this segment. I'd like you to turn as we close out this short portion to Colossians 1, 25 to 29. Colossians chapter 1, 25 to 29. You'll see how interesting Peter and Paul are uh, as they share their inspired thoughts and convictions with us as God's word. Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 to 29. These are profound thoughts, friends. And my prayer is today we not only appreciate them, but we will learn to discern what's in them. We see a lot of things, but we only see the outer portion. The husks, not the kernel. We need to see the substance. And here Paul saw it. He said, you say, oh, Paul was converted. We need to be converted as well. You may not be a Damascus experience, but nevertheless, it is as profound as that conversion experience was. Colossians 1, uh, beginning with verse um, 23. Did I say 23? Well, let's begin to 25. I wish we had more time, but we don't. Anyway, you read it for yourself. The one preceding, the one following. But in verse 25, we pick up from that. It says, Paul writes, Whereof I am made a what? A minister 
according to the dispensation of God. You see what's coming now. Why was he made a minister? It says, I was made a minister of God which is given to me for you. Given to me for you. For what? He says, given to me for you in order to fulfill the word of God. That was why Paul was called to be a minister. Not just to the Gentiles. But for the gospel according to the dispensation of God. And what was this? It included a mystery. You see, when the Bible speaks of a mystery, you can pop all the atoms and electrons in stretching that thing out. You won't be able to unravel that mystery until the Bible unravels it for us. And it's revealed. It says even the mystery in Paul being called to be a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to him for us, in fulfilling the word of God, it is the mystery which has been hid from ages, from generations. But now, it makes all the difference. But now, in front of you, is made manifest to whom? His saints. Not to the world. You can read that in John. He was in the world. The world was made of him. But they, they didn't know him. They didn't see the light. They saw the darkness. It is to those whom he calls his saints. He, not me. To whom God would make known what is. And I had to underline this. Would make known the riches of the glory. We often talk about the glory. But about the glory, about the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Jews. Why is that? You better give attention to this. When you're reading stuff, make sure. Because Paul was called apostle to the Gentiles. But he's writing to the Christians. And to everyone. He says, the, glory, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles? It is, there you go, we talked about that. When we've been purified, Christ will be revealed to the world. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's where he says, now this I am a minister of, whom then he says, I'm not just the minister of, he says, we. You see, now this is inclusive. To begin, it was exclusive to me. For you, now having received that, it is we, whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man. Now we can talk about wisdom, because it comes from Christ. In all wisdom, that we may present every man what? Perfect. Again, in through whom? In Christ Jesus. Now, it's time to pull all up our sleeves. Wherefore, or whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in us mightily. Mighty works in and through Christ. For if you do these things, you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you today.